if you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we begin to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the 13 vampiric legacies in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the Bonsam, Akananse, and Naglapas. So, Neonate, you wish to learn more about the Lionborn, do you? The kindred of the Ebony Kingdom, or Africa, to be less dated and pompous about it? I am surprised. Pleasantly so, I might add, but surprised all the same. As I said previously when I spoke of them, they do not get the attention I feel they deserve. I hadn't expected you to return so quickly wanting to learn more about the legacies, their term for clan, which... which I can see you remembered. You... You brought your notes on the kindred of the Ebony Kingdom. Oh, excellent work, my child. You're learning, and it's only taken you a year. I am almost proud. What's that? You want me to choose the order in which we discuss them? Well, your flattery is not needed, but it is appreciated all the same. Hmm. Why don't we discuss the ones that are closest to my clan first? I refer to the Bonsam and Akananse, the latter being a descendant of the other. But we cannot mention the Bonsam without mentioning the Naglapas, for they are two deemed offshoots of the Bonsam and the Mitsi, for that matter. But you seem puzzled. How can a legacy be a descendant of two breeds of kindred? Well, I did mention it to you previously, which makes this a wonderful opportunity for this Westerner to give his interpretation on these African legacies, starting with the frightening Bonsam. Now, I should inform thee that I cannot be certain with their parent clan, presuming that they have a parent clan at all. Judging by their disciplines of obfuscate, potence, and a bomb way, it could be implied that they are a descendant of my clan, Clan Nosferatu, but there is some evidence to suggest that they are actually closer to the Niktuku, actually, which I am entitled to believe, but I will get onto that in a moment. For I see the Abombwe discipline has thrown you somewhat. It is a discipline belonging to the Bonsam and the Akanense exclusively, and acts as a cross between animalism and protean, with both legacies holding a different relationship over it. During our Dark Ages, where the Bonsam were most prevalent, a Bombre was a discipline that was spawned from darkness, not the Abyss, but a primeval darkness that inhibits predatory prowess, allowing the Liabon to cloak themselves in darkness, sense nearby predators, imitate certain animal features like poisonous glands, or, to go a step further, to take on the form of a creature whose heart, liver, or another vital organ the Bonsam has eaten. I lost a cat that way once, and I was most irate, shall we say. Whilst the Akananse can perform these feats too, they view the discipline in the truest sense of the word, as they believe it connects them to the animal kingdom and better understand their beast, learning to better control their frenzy. A Bombwe is traditionally not taught to kindred in the Western world, so if you wish to learn it, I say you're in some pretty tough shit, Neonate. But returning back to the Bonsam and their connection to the Nosferatu, or perhaps the Niktuku, we must explore how the Nosferatu and Niktuku came to be. As you should remember, the Nosferatu clan progenitor, my grandsire, was a man called Abzimiliad, who was embraced by Zilla, the beautiful, the third child of Cain, and his first wife. He valued two things in life, Abzimiliad, I mean, his prowess as a hunter and his remarkable beauty. The former caught the attention to embrace him, putting up quite the chase to find him, making the hunter the hunted. Zilla would get her way but left a scratch on Abzimiliad's pretty face. He would grow angry and bitter at his wound, resulting in Zilla to curse him with ugliness. Not wanting to put up with the abuse and bullying, he hid and embraced others like him. And the only way he could get his beauty back was to slay all of his descendants, or at least that's what the story dictates. But I am not a fan of this particular theory, as it seems far too simple to be true. The second story is an extended variation on the first. Abzimiliad, like many of his future childer, was a loner, best known for being the best hunter in the land. The beautiful hunter would spend days in the wilderness to return with enough game to feed an entire village. The second generation of vampires were just as power-hungry as any other generation, wanting to build armies of the best canite candidates they could find. Zilla was certain that Abzimiliad would not fall under such politics, and enticed him with the offer. 
On the surface, becoming a vampire seemed like a fantastic idea. Near-perfect invisibility, additional strength, and the ability to command animals would make him the ultimate hunter. And for a time, he and the Gangra would call nature their home, gallivanting in woodlands and pastoral green killing and hunting as kindred spirits, to pardon the pun. Over time, however, Abzimiliad would stop feeling like a true hunter, as he could very easily cheese his way to victory. When confronting Zilla about his woes, her response did not soothe him. It angered him, and he would begin to plot his revenge against her by building an army, falsely in her name, filled with murderers and killers who glorified in the killing and slaughtering of prey. Some of his more notable child were Baba Yaga, Vasilia, and Echidna. No, 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 not the animal, but the half-snake, half-woman Greek monster. Abzamiliad and his brood would be some of the leading figures in the slaughtering of the second generation. All of his child would remain loyal to him, except for the one who escaped being bloodbound to him and became the modern incarnation of the Nosferatu clan. I'm fairly certain you have heard of her. Medusa is her name. The Matriarch. Cain would obviously catch wind of the news of the slaughtering of his childer, including his beloved Zilla. He would punish the vain antediluvian with hideous features, rather than killing him outright, bringing his inner monster to the surface. Whilst Cain considered the matter closed, the Nosferatu antediluvian would seek revenge, charging his monstrous Niktuku into wiping out all kindred. I would carry on, but you don't need to be reminded of the disgusting love stories with him and you know who. <laughs> Knowing that the Bonsam are hunters, you can see what the Niktuku hunter elements have seeped into the Bonsam culture, but what does that have to do with Africa? Well, I should remind you of our Golden Age. The Ventu had Rome, the Brugia had Carthage and did a pretty good job of controlling the Kine. We did too, but not in a similar fashion as they did. Whilst they dominated or presenced their way into the minds and hearts of the humans, many Nosferatu conquered Africa, convincing the poor bastards we were demigods that required human sacrifices. You probably don't remember me telling you that regarding the Nosferatu, which doesn't surprise me at all. Most people have only an interest in the residents of the First World. The Nosferatu of old played into their superstitions, holding forests, crags, caverns, and caves as their domains, places the sun could barely touch them. We let the Setites have Egypt, of course. We protected the kind as much as we stalked and fed upon them, keeping ourselves to ourselves, shunning the rest of kindred society. Not much has changed, really, when you think about it. Anyway, this superstition would feed nicely into the Liaborn's presentation on the creation of Abzimiliad, if you wish to believe the Bonsam are indeed connected in such a fashion. It involves a lone hunter originating from what would be the Akan City and Ivory Coast. He would stray far from home, for his village had succumbed to a great famine, for the village's animals had died. He would discover an ancient darkness, buried in the ground to hide from the sun. It fled from the hunter, luring him into its domain with a beautiful song, in an attempt to use the hunter's mortal shell as a means of protection. In less delicate words, the darkness, most presumably Zilla, embraced the hunter. This being said, that hunter claims to have never been embraced or has embraced, implying that if this claim is in fact true, the Bonsam may have originated as an artificial bloodline, although other Bonsam can and do embrace normally. The Bonsam story continues, stating that the hunter would return to his village confused by what had happened. The darkness within him boiled in a wave of savage anger, overwhelming the hunter. When his senses returned, the villagers were slaughtered and the hunter fled far inland, never to return. It is not difficult to work out that the hunter frenzied and devoured those around him. The story is not all that different from the western views on Absimiliad if you were to put your mind to it, which speaks volumes on what it is like to be a Bonsam. There is a reason why they are called Unseen and Stalkers. They are solitary Liabon and incredibly territorial. They will hunt you down if you stay too long in their domain and refuse to leave when asked. As such, there is next to no organisation within the legacy. The Liabon here are incredibly stealthy hunters, perhaps greater than the Niktuku and Asamites combined. Sires embrace only the most skilled and talented of hunters and warriors, which may include assassins in the modern knights. Gender is never important, only the talent of stalking and killing. They have been known to hunt in temporary packs, communicating in guttural shrieks that can be heard in a one mile radius. If you ever found yourself in such a pickle, well, I'd just kill myself if I were in your shoes, or hope your obfuscate is incredible, assuming that you have it, of course. 
the valor during the hunt is something that would make Absimiliard proud if one can say such a thing about a salty antediluvian. But there is one interesting detail regarding the clan weakness that skews their Nosferatu lineage, if such a connection even exists. They possess a primordial fear that mortals cannot stomach, but it is not to do with their physical appearance per se. This to me would imply that their Auron, the Liabon's spiritual side, is inherently much higher than the eye, the human earth part of the soul, which would make sense if one were to believe that the darkness that exists within them is true at all. It is fair to assume that the Bonsam are near to extinction, as most exist as either Naglapers or Akinanse in the modern nights, as the Bonsam Elder refused to embrace and, in its madness, try to devour its own line, just like the ongoing goals of Absimiliard. Those who escaped decided to fix in their blood by performing strange transfusions from other canines. In South Africa, they utilized blood from a Zemitsi explorer, founding the Nagalpa lineage. West African Bonsam would create the Akananse line with the help of an unknown source of ancient blood, but each respective legacy would have their own take on their creation mythos, as we shall soon explore. Let us start with the Akananse, who are often presented as a gangrel bloodline, for they possess fortitude and animalism alongside a Bombay. What connects them more so is that they also become more bestial in their appearance as time goes on, not when they frenzy. Unlike the Gangrel, the shifting appearance of the Akananse is down to the more knowledge they gather regarding the beast and vampire lore, which connects them to the Nosferatu in terms of lore hunting anyway. What features they gain depends on the environment they are in and what lives there. For example, the Akananse may grow a hippo's jaw, or a lion's mane, or spider's legs, which is the perfect segue into their believed origin story. The Akananse are said to originate in Ghana and are a living embodiment of the Ashanti belief that is the legend of the wise spider. This tale speaks of a spider who travelled the world on strains of its webs during a time when there were no stories. Both it and the animals wanted to learn, so the spider went to the sky gods, who were said to have all the stories, beginnings and ends. They would comply with the spider's request, only by having the spider complete some tasks and, with some cunning and clever trickery on the spider's part, would win the box of knowledge and everything and would share it with the other animals. This story tells us that the weavers are the ones most disconnected from the jihad, disorganized and driven nomads who only wish to share their stories with those who are prepared to listen. They are well regarded within the Ebony Kingdom for their knowledge. The Guruhi valued them as advisors, as do the Shango when it comes to delivering justice. On the other hand, the Zidundu and Setites do not trust them, fearing they are no more than Guruhi spies. As for the Naglapas, the other Bonsam creation, everyone fears them. They are the aptly named horrors of the Ebony Kingdom, with every African horror story and rumour wrapped up in a humanoid form. They make the Zemitsi, whose blood runs in their veins, pussycats in comparison. That said, they share a similar weakness to the Zemitsi and have to bury themselves in the earth as they rest, some eagerly wanting to learn the western discipline, protean, and be like the beasts do. Whilst the Akinense try to attune themselves to the beast, the Nagropas let it rise to the surface and ravage everything in its path. And with a more volatile version of vicissitude at their disposal, they can reshape personalities as well as bodies. Like the Bonsam, they are incredibly territorial, not trusting other Liabon or each other for that matter. As such, you won't be too surprised to learn that they are implacable foes, often the warning to younger Liaborn what will happen to them if they let their monstrous side rule supreme. They can either be powerful warriors or competent witches. Their name is the Kahokian word for evil sorcerer or nightwalker, depending on whom you ask. It also comes from the Ashanti word Asan Bonsam, which should sound familiar to you. Anyway, Asan Bonsam is a common legend in Africa. It is a horrific creature resembling a man with hooked feet that would use its appendages to reach down and snatch passerbys to feast on their bodies. The Nagropas feed into this legend, often reshaping their lower bodies with vicissitude to do this as well so they can perform their favourite torture method. They take a victim, reshape them into the legendary Asin Bossom form, with the promise to restore them if they act out the legend on innocence. This is usually a lie, as the tortured soul would end up gold, dead, or the target of further more horrific tortures. As I previously said, it puts the Samitsi to shame. Incredible, really, if you think about it. Three different breeds of vampire, all connected to each other but very different mindsets and cultures. What I believe connects them, other than the fact from what I just said and the fact they are Liabon, 
is solitude. Each one thrives best on its own, mastering a different thing. One is the master hunter, the other champions scholarly exploration, whilst the other is at the top of their game in the field of torture. Each one monstrous in appearance, two are monstrous inside, one by design, and the other by choice. The three legacies, the beastly legacies as I like to call them, are some of the most feared and respected in the Ebony Kingdom, each one for a completely different reason. You may think that the Akonanse are far more refined than the other two, but remember the powers of the Bombwe. They can put up a fight if need be, and just because they have no concerns with the Jihad, it does not mean they are not capable of turning the political hierarchy inside out. The might of one's brain can often be just as powerful as flesh warping claws and relentless stalking. Of course, there is no shame of turning your foes inside out on occasion. That can just be as effective as getting the message across. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.